Hello. Well, we've got to the end of the second week of the MOOC in concurrent programming in Erlang. And I wanted this week to give some feedback and discuss with you a couple of things that had come up. Two of the steps have provoked quite a bit of discussion. Um, I wanted to talk through the rationale we had for uh, taking the approach we did and say a bit more about each of those. So, first of all, in the second part of the week, um, we talked about supervision. And what we did in step 210 was to ask you to think about supervision in the context of the frequency server. So, the idea there was to set something quite open-ended um, and to provoke some discussion, which we clearly did. <laughs> we also provoked discussion about the fact that there were two typos in there, so apologies about that. It's all fixed now on the... Uh, so if you're coming to this for the first time, don't worry, typos are gone. But um, it was an open-ended question, and I think what we'll do in future runs of the course is simply make that a discussion and ask something a bit more focused as the assignment. But let's talk through what the, um, the ideas are behind this assignment and thinking about supervision of this particular server. Now remember what we've got is a server which um, provides frequencies to clients. We have control of the server as it were, but the clients are, are relatively autonomous in this model. And of course what we're doing here is building an Erlang model of a real complicated system of hardware and software. Um, what we have done is we started off with a simple frequency server and then we moved to a model where we hardened it so that if a client died while in possession of a, a frequency, the server would be made aware of that and was able to recycle that frequency. And we did that by linking the client and server. And remember, links are bidirectional. We chose at the server end to trap exits so that we would see, we would receive a message if a client terminated while holding a frequency, and we could therefore recycle that frequency. Now let's assume that the clients don't trap exits. There's no reason for a client to worry about the, whether its server is running or not. It will find out if the server is, is fallen over because a call will fail. Um, so let's, let's assume that um, clients are not trapping exits. Because links are bidirectional, if a server fails, the clients will themselves all fail. And so we'll be in the situation that no frequencies are allocated. So when we restart the server, we simply have all the frequencies at our disposal. So it's not really a problem, assuming that clients aren't trapping exits. Now, suppose clients are trapping exits um, and the server fails. What might happen? Well, if the server hasn't been restarted, the server is named, and so sending a message to a named process that doesn't exist will itself fail. So clients will fail for that reason. Um, so a client might fail if you wanted to re reallocate a frequency. Um, there is a, a third thing we might think about in this context, and that is that we might think about replicating some of the state or backing up some of the state from the server inside the supervisor. That could be achieved by the supervisor regularly pinging the server and getting the server to send its current set of allocated frequencies, for example, so that when the supervisor were to restart the server, it would restart it, making that um, assuming the state was unchanged. So it is possible to do that. But I think the simplest model is, and the cleanest is, and this, this makes the most sense as far as, um, as the real world is concerned, a real world client phone will not be able to monitor the, um, uh, will not be able to trap, trap exits, metaphorically, from a server. Um, it's to assume that, that clients are not trapping exits. But I agree, it was, a, a, it was relatively open-ended and um, 
But I suppose this is how things are when you start looking at how Erlang scales up, and in particular, how you deal with fault tolerance. These are, these are relatively complicated questions. So that's, um, that's where we're at with, um, with that. The, the typos are fixed. Um, do have a try. You know, simply setting up a, a server, uh, uh, so, uh, apologies, setting up a supervisor, which will start the server, and if the server is, is um, halted for any reason, will restart it. And as, as it mentions in the um, assignment, you can check that that is actually happening by using the observer. OK, the other thing I wanted to talk about was some issues raised by step 215, and that was about try-catch. Um, and the general process of, of um, throwing exceptions, uh, catching errors, and so on. Let me explain the rationale of the course on, on, on treating these things. The key thing, as far as I can see, that we wanted to get across here was that Erlang handles um, failure in two different ways. First of all, it, um, it has the let it fail philosophy and what comes with supervision. It says, don't try and deal with, um, don't try and deal with exceptions, uh, don't try and deal with errors with it. Opposite operators, if you were um, working properly, and then simply fail and have a, a supervision architecture help you out there. I wanted to contrast that with a much more traditional approach where you can try evaluating an expression, and if that expression raises an error or, or um, produces an exit or, or throws an exception, that can be called. I wasn't terribly worried about giving you all the details, and apologies that, that perhaps some of the details were a bit a bit um, unclear. I simply wanted to contrast with the the novel "let it fail" and architectural approach with the more traditional "catch errors, raise an exception." For example, if you if you're parsing something and you you reach a state where you can't go any further, just raise an exception and have that dealt with by the enclosing code. So that's there as a, um, just to say, there's this traditional approach. Now, you can, what's perhaps less traditional is the fact you can pattern match on these, um, on what is caught, and there are three classes you can uh, pattern match on, errors, throws, and exits. And Robert Verding came in and made some comments about that, and that was really useful to have Robert contributing. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, I just simply had, had not, I'd assumed we were working at a more conceptual level, and so I was, I was working at that level. But now you've, you've um, there's more detail in there, there's more detail in Francesco and my book, and some of you also found um, stuff out there in Fred Eber's book. So more information is there. The idea I wanted to get across here was the, the concept, not the, not the exact details of what goes on. I hope you're finding the course interesting and, and enjoyable as well as challenging. I know we've seen a number of comments of people saying it takes longer than perhaps you'd anticipated. I think that's partly, it's it's an online course, it's a MOOC, where we're expecting you to think about and, and do some programming. Um, some other MOOCs are more, it's more a matter of watching some programs, discussing them a bit. I think once you start having to think about programming ideas that can take longer, um, in a sense, I think we're unapologetic about that because we, we feel that's how you're going to learn those ideas best. Um, so best of luck for the last week. What we'll cover in the, in the, the final week is thinking about scaling things up. So looking about multi-core, giving you a very brief introduction to Erlang OTP, talking a bit about Erlang and distribution. Um, more conceptual, uh, less, less gritty detail. No assignment this week, but there is, if you are, um, if you've taken the upgrade, there is a, a test this week um, on what you've learnt in the whole course. Okay, so have fun on the third and final week. Thanks very much.